you know, Professor Park uh, Carla, as well as the moderator, Professor Yen Hai Rong, uh, for making time for this and the rest of the panel and the audience. Thank you for making time for, for me and my colleagues here. So um, I'm going to put on the full screen. So share screen, right? Okay, I have it. Okay, um, everyone see this? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Yeah. Can you also turn it into a slide uh, show mode? Yeah, there you have it. Okay, good. Great. Um, so the title is a bit long, but it's self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, basically, um, we, we like to look at you know, domestic politics, regional politics. And you know, this is what uh, two of my other friends slash colleague have been working on for you know for some time, and we discovered that uh, no matter what's being said in the popular media and all those, what happens is if your logos don't work, you don't work, right? You know, this is just how it is, you know. And you know, we arranged the PBT in a rather technical format. Uh, main arguments, um, then a bit of background and theories. Then we have the results and the discussion. I think I can skip most of the theory part because um, it will take too much time anyway. So uh, the gist is local politics matter, right? And we are looking at two cases, ECRL, East Coast Railing. Um, I think most people would know this. Uh, cutting across the east coast of Malaysia, as well as the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Railway, which is in Indonesia. So we find that ECRL is pushed a lot faster because at the end of Malaysia is quite cohesive and power is very centralized. Uh, power is centralized towards a central government uh, within, within the executive and from the province slash state to the federal government. So when that happens, you have consensus. You know, uh, there is very little conflict. Even if there is conflict, I can weed you out very quickly. Whereas Indonesia is very different. It's very decentralized. Um, Jakarta cannot really fully control its provinces. Uh, the president cannot really control his or her line ministers or with the executive. So that's what we observe. So um, why Gao Tie? I think we don't have to discuss this, right? So this is East Coast Railing. Uh, I got it from a newspaper cutting. So yeah, um, it was believed that um, ocean trade, oceanic trade would reduce greatly if we built this, you know, Shenzhen to Port Klang. Uh, you know, we could, you know, the, this is based on estimates. We could reduce the time by about 30 hours. Uh, cost, it would be a bit more expensive based on the old estimate. It may change in the future, but that's the rationale. It was seen as a game changer, you know, bypassing Strait of Malacca and all those. And, you know, it's to connect the East, East Coast states, uh, Pahang, Trungano, Kelantan. Uh, the new version is a bit different and the, the point is that you're linking both coast, east coast to the west coast of Peninsula Malaysia. The price is, it was said to be uh, 55 billion ringgits, which is about 18 or maybe 16 US, US dollar billion now. And at the time it was, the time the Prime Minister was Najib Razak. So Najib Raza, uh, I think you would have seen him in the news uh, very recently. Um, at the time, Malaysia was very concerned with middle income trap. At the time, uh, we're now concerned with other things. But for quite a few years, I think Professor Tam would concur with me. Um, we were very concerned with the middle income trap for quite some time. And, and then nobody talked about it. So this was to uplift your income, to uplift your productivity, to uplift your connectivity. That was the plan. 
but uh, there is some allegations against it. Uh, there's a court case uh, which I'm not privy to the information, and you know, if you want, you can do your own research. So uh, CCCC is the main contractor. Um, Eighty-five percent of the cost is soft loan. And eventually, it became a political battleground between Najib Razak and Mahathir Mohamad, who returned to the premiership after a very long time. And then he left, right? He, he was perched. Um, I think it was almost, I think this year, this year, he was perched. And, you know, he was in power for about two years. And famously, he wanted to cancel or renegotiate it, which he proceeded to. And one could say that this was one of the projects that led to regime collapse of the Najib government in May 2018. So the Mahathir administration at the time cancelled it. So that's Mahathir on your left. Uh, that's Najib Raza on your right. So it was, uh, you see this in a lot of countries, Maldives and all those. Um, you have local elites, one of them will pick China or Chinese firm as the so-called bad guy. And the other side will be forced to defend that, that person. It is very common. <laughs> we are not discussing the logic here. We are discussing that it's easy to come up with the binary here. Um, it was very similar in Indonesia, uh, Jakarta to Bandung, high-speed rail, uh, but it cost less. Uh, the idea was simple. Uh, you know, you would have more uh, connectivity and you know when that happens your financial model will show you a certain amount of growth rate so on and so forth no problems and you know it connects Jakarta and Bandung uh, largest and third largest city 5.5 uh, .5 billion uh, cheaper than the Malaysian one 150 kil kilometers which is also shorter than the Malaysian one and the current Indonesian president when he came to power in 2014 uh, promise to rejuvenate public infrastructure. That's his promise. And, you know, he had to deliver on this. So this was one of the projects. And the contractor is CRCC, 75% um, soft loan, 25% by equity money, which is China and Indonesia. And, you know, like Malaysia, it became a political battleground between Prabowo Subiato uh, a former military elite of the Suharto era. But the different thing is that they survived, the Indonesians survived, the Malaysians didn't survive. Um, by survive, I mean political survival. And, and since then, Jokowi has continued to push it. So the guy, they, they may look a bit similar, but the guy on the left is Jokowi. Uh, the guy on the right is Prabowo. So incumbent on the left versus challenger on the right. Uh, since then, Prabowo has become Jokowi's Minister of Defence. So I think for now, the conflict is pushed down. So you can see that all this conflict, they can manage. It's how you manage it. So here's the snapshot of what's happening. Uh, ECIL, Malaysia, HSR, Indonesia. Um, after renegotiation, uh, Malaysia, we extended the, kilo, the, the length uh, it also became a bit cheaper, the cost. The business model became build, operate, and transfer, which theoretically is better than just a build EPCC uh, deal. And for the Indonesians, uh, the same thing was maintained uh, because there was no regime change. <laughs> and it was still a build, operate, and transfer model. So there was no big change there. So the theoretical framework, um, suffice to say, we built on Senior 2005's work about how elites interact. Elites at both levels, right? Sub-national level, they will build their institutions. And there will also be this uh, central institutions versus state slash provincial institutions. They mesh with each other, which we will see in a while. Um, yeah, we can skip this. And overall, if we can sum up, you look at Malaysia um, between the late 90s to today. Uh, why we picked the late 90s was because there was an Asian financial crisis. 
the regime collapsed in Indonesia, Suharto collapsed. Uh, and the whole thing, the whole power structure was reshuffled. It took years to come back to a normal form. Whereas Malaysia, it was, it was, it was actually Mahate. Mahate was PM then, and he, you know, he actually got to rule. Nothing collapsed. Things went on, and but Mahate did a lot of inventions. Um, he centralized power um, at two levels, um, from the province to the central government, Putrajaya and within the elites. So some ministries were had their powers claw back to the prime minister office. And we had an outcome that is cohesive. At two levels, the elites are cohesive. Whether they're right or wrong is irrelevant, but they are very, very cohesive. And when that happens, the project gets pushed. And you know, one of the things that we'll see later is the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance are essentially the same person. That happened in Malaysia. Whereas in Indonesia, it was the exact opposite. Indonesian suffered a fissure. So power was originally highly centralized, Suharto. It split up. Uh, power was decentralized to the provinces. Power was also decentralized from presidency to the line ministers. And, you know, by the mid and late 2010s, it was clear that the elites, they're not cohesive, they are in conflict. And when that happens, it's very difficult to push projects. You will see delays, which is what we are seeing now in Indonesia. So um, to make a snapshot, this is Malaysia. You can look at the number of players on the left-hand side. These are the key players, uh, Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. They're actually the same person during the Najib era. And this had been going on for some time. And the Minister of Economic Planning Unit, he was, he was very close to the Prime Minister. He was a part of the Prime Minister's office. And the Chief Ministers were all on Najib's, uh, were friendly to Najib, either his own party member or his allies. The opposition at that time was not very strong. It was led by Mahathir. So basically everyone was okay with this project, right? They were welcoming or at, at worst they were lukewarm, right? The incentive was to collaborate with the Chinese firms, the CCCC, so that you can push development. Whereas the opposition, the goal was simple, right? You know, just to oppose you and, you know, uh, you paint uh, CCCC and the local elites in a bad light. That's it. That was the strategy. If you look at Indonesia, the number of players increase, number of important players increase. So people who won the project are President Jokowi and Minister of SOE. Um, the Minister of Transport at the time, Jonan Ignatius, he was he didn't really like the project, neither did he outright object to it. Uh, but on a couple of occasions, if you look at his actions, it was almost as if he, he did it on purpose to embarrass the president. And the military was hostile to it uh, at various junctures. And Prabowo, if you count Prabowo, this guy is a former military elite as well. He's well connected. And the West Bandung region was a bit mixed. Right? He sometimes supports you, sometimes don't support you. And after after he gets a stadium, he supports you again, you know, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> so you, you see a lot more players, a lot more uh, interest at play in Indonesia. So predictably, um, you know, you have um, elite conflict in Indonesia, elite co cohesion at two levels. And when Mahate took over, uh, he axed the project. I think within a few weeks, he axed the project and he announced it in Beijing. And the fact that he could so easily axe it, it tells you that this guy is unchallenged. And the, the new prime minister is still very powerful. The, the, the whole state structure, state machinery is largely intact. It hasn't changed a lot. And because of that, the Prime Minister, once he wants to cut it off, he can cut it off. He or she can cut it off. It's not the same in Indonesia. There is more horse trading, bargainings, 
backroom deals, right? And when you have a lot of all these things, the projects slow down. People can roadblock you. Um, you know, the, a few lessons that we can piece up based on Senia's uh, framework is that, you know, projects like this, they are not entirely driven by economic rationale because both Najib, both Jokowi, um, they have non-economic motives. Najib, if you believe the newspaper, uh, you know, had some kickbacks from this project and other projects, but allegations, right? You know, those are allegations. And he had to secure the heartlands, the East Coast states. And this remains important to Mahathe and other prime ministers. And in Indonesia, it was very clear. Um, Jokowi went on, went, gained power because he was to rejuvenate public infrastructure. That's it. That's Jokowi. And same for Prabowo, he was, he was basically bashing China, like, uh, you know, this exports communism, this railway project exports communism. I, I don't know where he got that logic. I, I don't think he be believes it himself. He doesn't talk about it anymore now that he's in cabinet. Uh, but there's a lot of people who believe these kind of things. And, you know, the point number two is that uh, contestation. Uh, I, I've spoken quite a lot about it. You know, we don't have to go into that. So this is my last slide. And again, you know, uh, I want to emphasize that local politics matter, uh, Malaysia, because of a more centralized and cohesive po political structure. Uh, power is geared towards the center. Things get pushed, which includes this project. Indonesia. How is this person at both levels? And when that happens, um, things get slowed down. We're not talking about whether the project is good or bad, efficient or not efficient. We're simply saying which one gets implemented faster. That's our argument here. So that is my last slide. So I welcome any questions. We have a bit more time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Lin, for the presentation. So now the floor is open. Uh, Carla, can you please cl clear the Q&A um, so that we have new questions very visible for everybody to see? Um, people can ask questions either through Q&A or through chat or um, the panelists, you can just uh, turn on your uh, audio. Okay, please signal to me if you have questions. I see one question in chat. Um, Angela, do you want to turn <laughs> on your audio to speak? Sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna play devil's advocate because I'm also like been uh, researching this couple of uh, projects. So um, yeah, I wanted to ask like, if you think that power is so dispersed in Indonesia, um, uh, how come the Jakarta Bandung is actually moving forward faster than um, than the ECRL? Uh, do you think it's just a matter of uh, um, you know the change of government that happened in Malaysia, or also is it because uh, maybe Widodo was able to um, to actually build this consensus um, and basically speed up? Uh, a lot of things. I mean, there are a lot of evidence that point to the many presidential decrees and how much effort he has put in uh, speeding up a lot of things like uh, land ac acquisitions, for instance. Uh, that has never happened before, like, you know, such a project uh, in Indonesia to happen so fast in a way. So um, I think generally I really like the main point that the main political figure in a country is really essential for these large projects to move forward. Um, but I think at the same time, I think at the, um, yeah, the point about uh, power dispersion is, um, I mean, I don't see the, the you know, uh, how this impact is on the project outcome. Thank you. Well, thanks Angela for this. Um, well, First of all, um, I found it 
a bit difficult to get project com- where she going? <laughs> the project completion from the Malaysia side. Um, but Indonesia, what I was told, it, it uh, I mean, I read the newspapers because I can't go to Indonesia recently. Neither can you, all of you. So the project completion rate ranges from anywhere from 5% to 33%. 5% to 33%. It's a big variance. Uh, Malaysia one, I, I don't have the figures because I there was none. But what I do know is that land acquisition was not a problem. It, w- it was never a problem to start off with. And you have to understand that the Indonesia one started earlier whereas the Malaysia one started later the, the Indonesians basically took the blueprint from JICA and went to the Chinese and there was a lot of horse trading involved I'm not privy to uh, a lot of the information but uh, the blueprint suffice to say was handed to the, the Chinese had the view of the Japanese the JICA project and whether that helped in pushing the project nobody can tell right I mean, if you ask Junan, he'll give a different answer. But one thing I want to, I mean, I still believe the Malaysia one is faster. I mean, the fact that we can chop it, not not we, like Mahathir, the fact that Mahathir can chop it, revive it so quickly, it tells you something. It, it, it means that, hey, I'm king, you know. I'm, I'm king. You know? I mean, I, I mean... I think the new government also wants to have some modifications of the ECRL, I think. So it's also this power switching in Malaysia. I would argue that uh, it's less stable than Indonesia, in, in a way, because the government changed already twice in the last yeah, two or three years. So. But the structure does not change. Mm. I mean, but we can, that's party politics, right? We're talking about structure. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah, and I see what you mean. I'm not going to talk about party <laughs> politics. That is not interesting to me. <laughs> anyway, um, if you look at institutions, if you look at Indonesia, uh, Jokowi had this national infrastructure project. So when you put projects under that, theoretically, it gets implemented faster. Uh, Malaysia, we don't need that. You know? we, we don't really need that. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you just park everything under the prime minister office. At one time, we had maybe 10 ministers you know, in, in the prime minister office, right? Yeah, and that's power centralization. Those are ins- you know, institutions. And how can you have a minister of finance serving as the prime minister? I don't think it would happen in the UK, Australia, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think it would happen. Indonesia it has always been separate, even during the Suharto years. So that's institutions. Malaysia has more complete institutions, right? So it's plug and play. You know, anyone can become prime minister. Anyone can use the institutions. So that's that's my understanding of the situation. There's a question from Q and A. Um, the oh, question please. is from Karen Zhu. Have there been any attempts in sub- sabotaging the two projects from opposition parties in these two countries? If so, how? Um, the, uh, I wouldn't say sab- sabotaging is a bad way of saying it, but uh, asking for their fair share, I, I think, is, is probably a more correct way of saying it. Because, come on, Mahathir hated the project, right? I mean, and then he liked it back, right? No, I, I don't know. You know, you need to ask Mahathir now. <laughs> but if you look at Indonesia, uh, it's the same. You know, Prabowo hated the project, exports communism. Uh, you know, uh, threatens the Indonesian motherland and stuff like that. Uh, funny how he keeps quiet now that he's in cabinet. I mean, isn't it strange? I, I mean, if you're consistent with your voice, you should be consistent with your voice. You know, keep making a noise. Why do you stop making noise when you enter government? Why do you stop when you become prime minister or minister of defense? Well, we see that in Zambia as well. <laughs> okay. It's the same, uh, uh, there's, there's also a question from Professor Tam. Do you want to uh, uh, turn on your vo- audio, Professor Tam, to ask your question? 
How did they win? Oh uh, my gosh. Hi, hi, Guani. I, hi, Prof. Uh, as noted by Angela, you know, Malaysia has many regime changes uh, and we have another change in the administration. So do you see, since the project is very much top driven, do you see any change in the priority of the project under the current administration? For Malaysia or? For Malaysia. For Malaysia? Under Malaysian. Uh, I don't know who to, who to listen to. Do you listen to the incumbent or the opposition? <laughs> because now apparently the talk is that they're going to reroute it back to the original route, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's what, what I heard. <laughs> so. That's what I read on Facebook. You know, the, the former transport minister said that on Facebook. Um, I don't like Facebook, but you know, you get a lot of things on Facebook. So um, that's what Minister Lok said. Uh, I don't know what Minister Liu, Liu said yesterday or two days ago or later on. Uh, the, the, the point is, it's very opaque, right? We were never given the blueprint, you know, feasibility study. We were never given. Uh, Indonesia, likewise, uh, no. None whatsoever uh, given. And, you know, how did they win? I at least you can say that in the, in Indonesia there was the Chinese side and the Japanese side. <laughs> At least you can say that. Uh, I don't think in Malaysia, not that I know of, apart from CCCC interest being very interested in that project, I have never heard of any other companies wanting to do that project. At least not to the level of uh, researcher. <laughs> But still, it's a railway, yeah. Yeah, there are two questions in the Q&A. Oh. Um, one question is about how did CRCC and CCCC win the projects respectively? And the other question is, I'm going to give you two questions and you can respond to both of them. Huh. Uh, the other question is, isn't decentralization in Indonesia pro providing more stability and governance for infrastructure projects? vis-a-vis -vis centralization in Malaysia, um, corruption and patronage? Um, I think the first question by Frank Farr is, is similar, quite similar to what Prof Tan say. How did they win? Uh, I think for CRCC, basically what we knew was that they came up with terms that are more acceptable to the Indonesians than the one offered by JICA and primarily is about the financing yeah. financing terms. Uh, the Chinese were more lenient with the financing terms, whereas the Japanese were not so lenient with the financing terms. And of course, one can argue that, oh, Jokowi wanted to reduce reliance on Japan, right? You can say that, of course. And that's what we know. That's what we know. For Malaysia side, I, I am not sure who CCCC bid it against because it was announced in the news and there was no open bidding that I know of. There was there's no open bidding that I know of. So uh, essentially it means that you walk in with a bid, you, you, you kind of win, right? <laughs> essentially, <laughs> that's, that's the understanding. Well, for the next question by Sandin, um, isn't decentralization providing more stability? This is by, I wouldn't quite agree with that statement because, because you can't say that decentralization doesn't open up room for pork barrel politics. You can't say that. You, you can't say that because if you look at the West Bandung region, uh, the man's been demanding a lot of things, stadiums, roads, toll roads, you know, uh, because he has to protect his constituency, right? That's what he says. One can interpret that as potentially seeking pork, right? With centralization in Malaysia equals arrow corruption and pat patronage. Um, the case could be made for decentralization as well. I'm not saying centralization is the best in the world, but 
it, it's not a safeguard against it. It's not a safeguard against it. There are many factors at play, institutions. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't see it in so easy terms. Yeah. 